Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. We have with us a guest on this week, Dr. James Hollis, Jungian analyst, author, speaker, teacher, professor. Am I leaving anything out there? Well, I think that's the resume. Right. And he's going to help uh, us figure out why Jungian analysis is beneficial. I told you in the email, Dr. Hollis, that I think a lot of people could benefit from a Jung's ideas, depth psychology, Jungian analysis, but not very many people are exposed to these ideas. No, oh, sadly, that's the case. And um, frankly, <clears throat> in the interests of uh, expediency and uh, cost main maintenance and so forth, um, much of the psychological world, as you well know, has sort of divided us into behaviors, cognitive processes, and pharmacological issues, and all of which we have and all of which we are, but you add them together, you don't equal a full human being. There's always something else missing. And um, I would go so far as to say so much of modern psychology, often driven by the need to appear scientific, and secondly, to um, you know, serve with insurance companies and other external forces that have nothing to do with the uh, inherent health of the soul of the patient or the individual, the, these, these forces have produced a kind of failure of nerve to take on large questions. And I, I think that um, Jung's concepts really address the issues of what it means to be a human being. Who am I? And what, what am I to do with this? precious life that I have? Uh, who am I apart from my roles? Uh, who am I apart from my history? What may be exp wanting expression in the world through me? These are questions that um, most psychological systems don't even begin to address. They, they focus on symptom relief, which is understandable at some level, but they don't often ask the question, well, why have those symptoms come? And, and what correctives might be um, being called for? In, in the life of the individual. So I think Jungian psychology most is an effort to address the fact that we are meaning seeking and meaning creating um, animals. And um, when we are disconnected from that, which is consistent with our inner life and, and disconnected from that which is meaningful, um, you know, we suffer. And um, Right. Therapy of, of meaning is, is not something that's uh, particularly saleable. It's not something that's uh, easily transferable from one, th one person to another. Um, but it is, in the long run, that which uh, most sp uh, specifically, and I think most deeply, speaks to uh, who we are as persons. Yeah, it's so alluring. I mean, we have these huge machines called fMRI brain scanners, and we can look at what anxiety looks like in the brain. Mm -hmm. Oh, somebody has an anxiety problem. That's exactly what it looks like in the brain. So let's just simply relieve that symptom. And it's alluring. It looks very great on a grant proposal, but it doesn't ask the question, well, wait, how did that get there in the first place? Yes. And, and of course, how do I deal with that? Since anxiety is pretty ubiquitous, it sort of comes with the human condition. If, if you're a sensitive human being, you're going to suffer anxiety and distresses and mm -hmm. You know, I, I think the question is, how do you live your life in as full a way possible in the face of that anxiety? It's not like it ever fully goes away. I mean, obviously, we outgrow some anxieties, but others um, stay with us. And, and we need to understand that the anxiety is not the real pathology. The pathology shows up in terms of what it makes us do or what it keeps us from doing. I was just yeah. talking someone earlier today and as a matter of fact on this issue it was a person who repeatedly was sabotaging herself uh, by missing deadlines and and not carrying through on things she knew that were necessary for um you know the furtherance of her career and her development and so forth and we had to ask the question so what, what do you get from this self-sabotaging behavior what's the payoff well, the payoff apparently was the avoidance of anxiety. It's like I, I feel awful because my life's not moving forward, but I feel anxious if if it is moving forward because I have to take on new challenges and apply myself and risk something. And and the truth is that's where our life is most profoundly found, which is in the element of risk, where we start pushing against those 
limitations. And if you think you're ever going to be anxiety free, well, you know, good luck with that. That's that's not a that's not a steady state possibility for human beings. Yeah. What's the payoff? That is a great question. Why are you really doing this? Yeah, I think mostly unconsciously. I don't tell, tell me what you think about this. It's mostly unconscious, but people link something that they're afraid of with simply being bad. Just a roller coaster, for example. I'm afraid of that. And we, we don't actually say the roller coaster is bad, but we will link that unconsciously. Mm -hmm. And really, I think the work you're talking about here is actually realize that it's not the roller coaster that's bad. It's the fact that we avoid it. Sure. That is, well, not bad, right? That's not the word we use, but unhelpful. Mm -hmm. Not a helpful way of looking at the situation. It's, it's the avoidance of it, not the fear itself. Well, you know, what I found through the years as, as an analyst is that most people don't very ha have a very high opinion of themselves. And those who have a high opinion of themselves are usually <laughs> narcissistic disorders. So um, it's, it's, it's a fact that most people going, go around feeling um, a kind of state of shame. In other words, everybody else has it together, but I don't. Everybody else knows what they're doing, but I don't know. How do I believe that or know that? Because I look at them from the outside and they don't sit there and they necessarily tell me what their life issues are and how they're struggling. But uh, I know I'm struggling and I just assume others don't have these problems. So if I'm the one with the problems, you see how easy it is to go to a position of shame, feelings of unworthiness, feelings of, of inadequacy and uh, constantly comparing oneself with someone else. And you know, the, the truth is virtually everybody is stuck inside their sack of skin and trying to figure out how do I best get through this day and how do I deal with these stresses and so forth? And uh, frankly, how do I hide that from others? So I, I think it's so important in recognizing that um, everybody you know is really struggling. Over 2000 years ago, uh, Philo of Alexandria said once, be kind, everyone you meet has a really big problem. And I, I try to remember that every day. Everybody you meet has a really big problem, and I would add to that, everybody you meet has something that they know more about than you do. That's right. That's right. And also, everyone you meet has some secret areas of shame, fear, inadequacy, uh, stories or understandings of themselves they would be loath to share with you. So uh, they're, they're not going to, and uh, there's no reason they have to, but the point is don't presume they too are not caring what you yourself are carrying. Right. But I think to go back to what you were saying earlier, it's not the fact that you have the problem that you're struggling with. With It's the fact that you don't have a great relationship with the problem, for lack of a better term. Sure. You don't know how to talk about it. You uh, can't put it in a certain in a conception that you can understand. And then maybe you go to a, a evidence space, as we call today, therapist, which is fine. I understand the purpose of cognitive behavioral therapy. But if they just talk to you about the thoughts and the behaviors, Mm -hmm. Well, you're not really dealing with the issue. No, no. Uh, f first of all, there's some pragmatic questions one can ask of one's place in life. Uh, one I just touched on, um, what is this situation or what is this problem making me do or what is it keeping me from doing? So then you have to say, all right, well, that, that's an important juncture in my, that, my life. Then you have to ask the question of every decision, every relationship. Uh, every sort of signal moment of, of uh, crisis in one's life, um, does this path make me larger as a human being or does it make me smaller as a, as a person? And I, I submit most of the time we know the answer to that. And by larger, mm -hmm. I don't mean um, <laughs> more successful in the external world, but I mean with a feeling, you know, I'm taking on my life. I'm, I'm living it as fully as I can you know, and, and that I can in some way affirm the richness and importance of the choices I'm making. And that sounds so simple in the abstract, but in reality, it means often cutting through, you know, the debris that we carry with us on the one hand and, and the intimidating fears that we have on the other hand and saying, you know, I'm here to live this journey in the best way I can. And so let me get on with that. And, and the thing that most stands in our way typically uh, is intrapsychic. That is to say, the, the fears that we have within us. One of the ways I put it in the book many years ago was every morning we wake in the, and we look at the foot of the bed and we see there are two grinning gremlins. 
One is called fear and one is called lethargy and they are the enemies of life. Fear says, oh, you know, it's too much for you out there. It's, life's too big, it's too tough. Uh, you're not up for it, um, ju just don't bother. And lethargy says, you know, chill out, turn on the telly, have some chocolate, tomorrow's another day. And you realize these two little gremlins uh, want to eat you alive every day. And even if you have a productive day today, they'll be there tomorrow. And so you have to remember that when they show up, those are inside of me. They are not about the reality of the world. They are things that I'm carrying from my history. And uh, the things I have to stand up against really are fear and lethargy within myself. Yeah, you mean these are things that I carry with me in my history, as in when I was a child, it was maybe productive. It was maybe helpful. It was maybe a helpful defense mechanism to tune out, to go into lethargy. But now that I'm an adult, it's maybe not so helpful. But we still have that remnant. We still have that emotional hold on of that course. perhaps payoff that we were going through as a child. Sure. One of the, the messages we all got in, as children, and it was factual, was simply the world's big and you're not. The world's powerful and you're not. So how are you going to deal with that? Well, we basically developed three defenses. The first line of defense, the most primitive, is um, avoidance. And we have many forms of avoidance, such as simple avoidance, procrastination, blaming others, um, and, and self-medication, and so forth. Or, or secondly, we, we try to get power over the situation. And, and sometimes that's a constructive thing to do. Education and learning our, our, our area of expertise and so forth is one of the ways to get power over it. And, and thirdly, is to give the world what it wants, you know. Uh, don't bother to find your path. Just see how you fit in and how you get people to like you and, and how you feel comfortable in your life. Now, again, those are primitive defenses, but necessary for every child. And the message we all learned that the world's big and I'm not is overlearned. And what it mm. tends to do is, is when we face stresses, when we face choices, and we have that history activated, then we wind up in those avoidant patterns or those power complexes or those, those compliance of behaviors. And in those moments, you know, we're literally pulled out of this world in this moment into, an, um, you know, where I once was. And no wonder we stay stuck. Yeah, well, I think if you want to talk about an archetypal holiday, New Year's might be one of them, because I think it is to fight off that pull towards lethargy, towards, oh, I can put it off till tomorrow, or, oh, I have plenty of time. Tomorrow's not just another day, actually. Yeah, it's New Year's Eve. Tomorrow's not another day. It is a different year. Yeah. Symbolic of the fact that your life is going away one year at a time. That's right. Well, it's certainly appropriate, um, you know, on a periodic basis to pull out and say, what's going on here? And, you know, does, do I think that that feels like that's the right path for me or not? Mm -hmm. That said, um, you know, January 1st is just an arbitrary designation. It doesn't occur in nature. It occurs in human constructs. So you have to say there's an ongoing accountability for how our life turns out. Every religious system there's ever been, every sort of psychological system, philosophical system, legal system has talked about accountability. Things happen to us, often grievous harm happens to us. But in the end, uh, most traditions, and I think most of us would agree, I am responsible for how my life turns out. There are many junctures over which I had no control, certainly, and sent me in one direction or another. But there are times in which, you know, it, it was clear to me that how I, I addressed that, how I ran from it or how I got defined by it, those were the things that caused me to stay stuck and mired in some kind of, of uh, old position. Yeah. Well, I, I think this will uh, lead into something I want to talk with you about is that there, there seem to me to be 10 years between you getting your PhD and studying at the Jung Institute in Zurich. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I was curious about that time in your life, and I'm, I'm guessing something like what you just talked about happened. Oh, absolutely. Sure, sure. My, my early life was in academia. I was trained in the humanities, and um, I, I considered it a very rich preparation for the kind of work I do, because in part, 
the the study of the humanities is really the study of human nature. Mm -hmm. And so what I learned there was certainly applicable in working with people later. But what I what I didn't find in academia was the any opportunity to address the question from whence do these things arise within us? We have many great forms of cultural expression and literature, Greek tragedy, the, the great religious traditions, art, music, and so forth. But w what's going on inside? You used the word unconscious before. And by definition, we can't talk about what's unconscious because we don't know. You know, the problem with the unconscious is it's unconscious. But on the other hand, it's there. I mean, we keep realizing there's tons of operations going on in any given moment. So there are other governments at work within us at all times for good or for ill. And secondly, we, we are creatures who create patterns and we recognize from time to time. Some of those patterns are helpful to us and some are not. And no one rises in the morning and looks in the mirror while brushing their teeth and say, says, um, today I'm going to do the same stupid counterproductive things I've done for a long time now. But there's a good chance that we will because of the presence of certain unconscious agencies or certain uh, unconscious energies or scripts or stories, whichever metaphor you prefer. And, and until I began to address that, um, I, I can't really begin to gain any sort of sovereignty in my life again. So the problem is, you know, how do I address the unconscious? Well, the, the irony is, if I may go on about this a bit, the, oh, the do. Um, we are equipped by nature as a self-determining system. And I'll give you examples in a moment. But again, in childhood, we were tiny, vulnerable, alone utterly dependent and vulnerable. And so our connection to these instinctual sources of guidance were always being interrupted by the need to adapt to, to the circumstances around us, some of which were very close at home in the family of origin, some of them were including the time and place into which we're born, the cultural influences, other influences such as poverty, disease, alcoholism, abuse, a thousand things that play a role and have so much power in the child's formative sense of self, because every child tends to think at some level, I am what's happened to me. And that's how we get uh, defined or scarred at times by things utterly unrelated to us whatsoever. So what happens then is we get separated from these instinctual sources of guidance. And, and what are those instinctual sources of guidance? First of all is the feeling function. Now, on the one hand, it seems so obvious, but we need to remember something here, and that is the utter autonomy of the feeling function. In other words, you do not choose your feelings. Uh, they happen as a qualitative analysis registered by some other kind of locus of energy or center of intelligence within you. Uh, your choice from an ego standpoint is, do I pay attention to them? Do I anesthetize them? Do I repress them? Do I project them onto someone else? Do I ignore them? Um, how do I pay attention? But if over time I really pay attention, in other words, I could be doing all the right things that I'm supposed to be doing as defined by my cultural milieu. I could be, quote, successful in the outer world and be utterly miserable inside. The world is full of these stories of people who've done all the right things or all the expected things and inwardly feel um, that there's something aching, there's something missing in their life. And so their right. feeling function is telling them the truth. And, and as simplistic as it sounds, we need to recover a respect for the autonomy of the feeling function because in the end, it's a qualitative analytic process that is autonomous. It tells you what is right for you and what is wrong for you. Secondly, we have energy. If I could just stop you there for a second before you go on, I just, I just want to add, and it becomes very destructive when we replace our own feeling function with the feeling function of somebody else. Oh, absolutely. Like, like we think, well, no, I am paying attention to my feelings, but really what you're doing is you're just using the nods of your boss, the nods of approval from your boss as a replacement for that. 
sure. which may feel good in the short term, but then perhaps you get to middle age, maybe, maybe something you could speak on, because I've known you've written about that. When then you get to middle age and you think, wait a minute, sure, that that wasn't my feeling at all. I was actually avoiding my avoiding pain instead of pursuing what I really wanted. Well, and that happens at a, at a deeper level, of course, usually in childhood, where a child has to, in some way, manage his or her feelings in order to fit into its powerless state. You know, right. you don't cross a parent, for example, without mm -hmm. kind of, of, of cost. And for some, the cost is so high that after a while, one becomes estranged from one's feelings. One can't even begin to take them seriously because it was at one point too risky. So, right. the, you know, the second system is the energy system. When you're, everybody knows this, but we forget it. When you're doing what's right for you, the energy's there. And there are times in life we have to mobilize our energy in service to the tasks of reality. You get up at three in the morning to feed the, the crying child. You, you go to work because you're a person of honor and you support yourself, et cetera, et cetera. But, but there are times over, over the long haul when putting your energy in the wrong place leads inevitably, as we know, to boredom, ennui, um, resentment, um, self-medication, depression. And, and again, this is the psyche's way of autonomously, and notice I've used that word autonomous again. In other words, we just can't will it away. Sooner or later, it creeps up on us. It's the psyche's way of refusing to cooperate. It's, it's like a work stoppage. <laughs> the labor force doesn't want to attend that project anymore. You, your boss may want you to, or you may feel that you need to for some reason, but, but the energy is not available. So again, when you have to say, I mean, I've, I've talked to depressed people before, and then suddenly their, their whole mood shifts, their eyes light up, et cetera. And I said, now notice you're not depressed. Why? And they immediately fall back into the depression. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I'm depressed. And the reason they weren't in that moment was because they started touching on that which really mattered to them. And when you, you, you activate or, or access or stand in good relationship to that which wishes expression through you, then the energy's there. It's always there. And, and people have had those moments of experience where you get in the zone, as it were where the energy flows because it's, it's nature supporting you, you know? And, yeah. and the third thing is we all, uh, and really quick, <laughs> sorry, just to interrupt very quickly. Uh, it's another way of saying the energy. It, would, would that be like a, a, how we would say today a, a boundary that like you have your own boundary. It sounds like the depressed person, he goes from being an effect of society as opposed to a cause when he begins thinking about what's important for him, his own needs, what he wants to do. Mm -hmm. Well, sure. But, you know, again, as in childhood, our boundaries are constantly violated and often in adulthood, too. Well, we don't even have one when we're children, really. I mean, that's correct. It's just totally dependent. That's, it, that's right. And, and that's where we learn again, overlearn the, the story of powerlessness. You know, right. so the third system is, is dreams. Now, most people don't pay attention to their dreams. But as a psychoanalytically oriented person, uh, we focus a lot on dreams. Because again, dreams represent an autonomous commentary uh, on, as to how our life is going as viewed from the perspective of that intrapsychic other, that other intelligence about which we know so little. It's what Jung called the self with a capital S to differentiate it from an ordinary ego consciousness, who I mm -hmm. think at any given moment. And so in a sense, the self manufactures the dreams. and. Sleep research has told us that we average about six dreams per night, um, and that's a lot of activity. Nature doesn't waste energy. And if you live to 80, six years of your life will have been spent in the dream state. And so it's so clear that in addition to processing the detritus of daily um, stimulus or stimuli, um, one, one also finds that the dreams represent a commentary on how things are going and they represent correctives and compensations. And I've, I've often found in working with people's dreams that for the first time when they begin to realize in, in so many words like, holy cow, there's that dream is my dream. I can't deny that it's my dream. 
but it's it's speaking from another standpoint and it's telling me exactly what I need to know or it's it's telling me what I was afraid to know or it was it's telling where, where I need to go. And it's at that moment you begin to really begin the recovery of personal authority, which is the central project of the second half of life, which I'll talk about later, maybe. But uh, dr- dreams are very important as a as a tool. And and fourthly, is the most important of all and the least definable of all. And that that is, again, this issue of meaning. If what I'm doing has meaning, um, I can go through hell. I can go through an awful lot. And I do it willfully, even joyfully, because I'm rewarded with the richness of meaning. And as Jung said once, the, the smallest of things with meaning is always greater than the largest of things without meaning. So we have a culture which tells us what it means to be successful. And, and, and when you're not able to be successful in those areas, at least you can fill your life with material objects or to anesthetize yourself or whatever. And you have to really ask yourself, right? Is this meaningful? I mean, we suffer more from disconnects from meaning than any other single pathologizing source in our lives. Mm-hmm. And if, if what I'm doing is meaningful to me, um, then then there's something inside of me that always supports me and gives that sense of the the worthwhile nature of what I'm doing. Otherwise, you know, our efforts are futile and merely repetitive and and frankly just burn out over time and i'm guessing you would say the more that we pay heed to our feelings our own energy or boundary what we really want to do in our dreams and that's how we would cultivate meaning absolutely am i putting words here (laughs) it becomes a byproduct of of living in right relationships yeah these things build on each other yeah that's why i almost never talk about happiness i'm i'm not (laughs) opposed to happiness but people think right. happiness is is a goal that you can reach and it's a steady state and you can be there forever. It's that's baloney. It's 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 a momentary experience of being in right relationship to your own soul. And when yeah. you, those moments, you're flooded with happiness, even in the presence of conflict and suffering. And and because the inherent rightness of your journey is somehow being confirmed from within. And otherwise, every other achievement in, in the world, that's, that's why if you look at the book of Ecclesiastes, someone figured this out about, I think, now 28 centuries ago. It begins with everything is empty. Everything is missed. Everything is, is futile. And it, it ends by, in a sense, saying, you know, one, one has to decide what is meaningful in one's life and live it that way. Yeah, that's uh, that's really good. Yeah, the problem I have when people talk about happiness is they pe- sometimes you'll hear people say, "Oh, just choose to be happy." Well, it's like, well, I don't know about that. That sounds like repression. Happiness is maybe the result of thousands, millions of choices, but to simply make the choice to be happy, I think you're going to be in denial of a lot of things that are really going on with your unconscious. Yeah. No, of course. I mean, that's just a form of denial, and. Uh... What, what we learn in that kind of thing is certainly our, our choice of attitudes makes a difference in our life. Nobody would deny that. But, you know, the fantasy that I can just choose to be happy means, all right, well, what's the price of it? Does that mean I ignore the suffering that's going on in the house next to me? Does that mean I ignore the injustices of the world all around me? Uh, if, if I'm going to be happy, what's what's the price of that? You know, reminds me of Voltaire's uh, Candide and, and uh, the, one of the characters who has been to the Caribbean and seen the horrible price of people there who had to la- labor in the sugarcane fields. And, and when he returns to Paris, says, at least now I know the price of a little um, <clears throat> cube of sugar to put in Milady's tea in Paris, you know. It's like once you once you figured out that the world is what it is, um, you know, that kind of attitude of just choosing to be happy sounds, frankly, rather fatuous and self-absorbed. Yeah, well, I've definitely heard it from a lot of uh, very influential psychologists. I mean, that kind of attitude of you could just make the choice to have certain thoughts, make the choice to have certain feelings. These, These are all iterations of the choice to be happy. 
Well, yes. And, you know, I, I have respect for cognitive therapy because we, we are a series of uh, sort of <laughs> ideas, if you will, emotion laden ideas. That's what complexes are. But there's also a one sidedness to their approach, in my view, that really misses the the tragic side of human nature and, and also the, the, the real cost of what it means to be a human being. And that much of the richness of our life actually comes out of those difficult times. Uh, you mentioned earlier the, the sort of like first life, early life and, and midlife and so forth. Um, you know, at age 35, right on uh, schedule, I was blessed with a depression. I certainly didn't think so at the time. Like anyone else, I would have thought, how quickly do I get rid of this? It hadn't occurred to me yet. But what one really needs to ask the question is, uh, why has this come? What is this asking of me? Not how do I get rid of it, but why has my own psyche reacted in this way? And <clears throat> what is it that I need to address in order to live in a respectful relationship with my own soul? And when I use the word soul here, um, I, I'm using it as the literal translation of the Greek word psyche. You know, our, our, our soul... Mm -hmm who we are at the deepest level. It involves our bodies, it involves our cognitive process, and it involves our spirit. But there's also this other element here of the human being as, a, again, a meaning-seeking, meaning-creating um, animal. And any psychology or approach to life that ignores that is, is ultimately going to be um, you know, overthrown. I mean, that's, that's been the, the message the message of all the great utopian movements of history is that they all had very narrow or very one-sided approaches to human nature, and, and the part that they had pushed away is what ultimately came up and bit them. Right. You were talking about dreams there, and I think when people hear dream and dream analysis, I mean, I, I know in, in our section of the world, we really... We don't see a problem with this, but I think most people tend to roll their eyes and go, oh, dream analysis, come on, are you kidding me? But the way I think about it, the way I try to communicate it is we make such a big deal about Hollywood and movies and yeah. the Oscars. Myth, right? This is the modern iteration of myth. Mm -hmm. And when your favorite movie coming out from your favorite director, you're there in line waiting for it. And your dream is a movie created by you. Well, exactly it's right. Like if you don't think you can get if, if you get get all that meaning out of um you know whatever the Oscar winning movie is going to be this year, well, what about the meaning you get out of the movie you created? Well, yes, and 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 not I as an ego, but something in me that other that is ultimately larger than any of my conscious operations. As you know, consciousness tends to arrogate to itself powers it doesn't have. It's um, sort of like wearing one of those miners caps in a, in a coal mine and thinking the world is and reality is what I can see in that narrow circle of life that light on my helmet allows. Little ignoring or little aware of the fact that there's the magnitude of the cave all around us and all of that is part of us as well. You know, we, we carry all of human nature with us. So um, at any rate, um, you know, I, I went to my first hours of serious therapy uh, with the natural assumption, let's get rid of this depression and resume life as it's um, as it was cruising along and rather well, it was quite well, but but something was profoundly missing. And and so little did I believe or know that I was beginning a quite different journey. And and since then, as you said, I've written quite a bit about, um, you know, second half of life issues. And um, what, is, what is most profound is, well, we have to remember this, first of all, we are living so much longer than what most of human, human beings have lived in history that we, we have to remember that, you know, in the classical era, the average length of life, this is average now, was thought to have been in mid-20s. In 1900, in North America, the average length of life, that's the United States and Canada, was 47. Yep. And today it's close to 80 on an, on an average in North America. And, you know, that's a whole second half of life chronologically, within which there are many phases and many lives and deaths and lives and rebirths and so forth. 
and the assumption that who I am and what my understanding of the world as a child formulates it will serve to um, guide me appropriately 80 years is really sort of delusional. So it's, it's clear that sooner or later, one is going to reach those moments where one finds one's roadmap is no longer applicable to the territory in which we find ourselves. We are our sense of a contract, let's say. Let's say that one has done all the right things as defined by one's family of origin or one's religious tradition or one's cultural influences, but it doesn't feel right inside. Well, what are we going to do with that? You know, and, and that question is, is really what opens the door to a, a different kind of journey. And I think that that central project, as I mentioned a few moments ago, of the second half of life is the recovery of a personal authority, which again was there in the beginning called instinct. But the recovery of personal authority means of the immense traffic going through us at any given time. It's, it's busier in our psyches in O'Hare and Atlanta, Russia, I can assure you. Which threads are coming from our own depths, our own souls, which are sort of ancestral messages, which are coming from the family of origin, which are coming from, you know, the, the culture in which I, I've uh, been, been nurtured by or wounded by, as the case may be. And to sort through those to find which voices come from my own depth and, and then to find the courage to live that in the world, because in the end, it all has to lead to action. If I don't act on this, nothing ever comes to pass. Nothing ever changes. Through the years, I've had so many people say, essentially, coulda, woulda, shoulda, you know. Mm -hmm. I always want to do this. Always, want to, w w and why didn't you? Well, well, there was this reason. There was that reason. There, was, you know, often good reasons. But in the end, those are the kinds of rationalizations that sour the soul. And um, in in the end, I, I would say, unless we're physically incapable of doing something, you know, you you still have that within you that fired your imagination. You still have that which was calling you to um, your your fullest personhood. I mean, your job is not to fit in. When you were a child, you learned my primary mission is right. to fit in. It's too scary and too risky not to. But your job here as an adult is not to fit in. It's to find your path and live your journey. Now, that is not narcissism. It's, in fact, service to something larger than your own narcissistic desire for pleasure and comfort. Um, it is yeah. not necessarily an easy path. But it's a path in which you're rewarded because it is meaningful. And ultimately, that's your greatest gift to others, whether it's your children or your, your partners or your society, is the more you become a, a fully, more fully realized human being, that's what you share with others. Otherwise, where I'm stuck or where I have issues, they, they are always spilling into my relationships with, my, with others. That's why Jung said once in a haunting way, in a constructively haunting way, he said, the greatest burden a child must bear is the unlived life of the parent. Right. So I think about that. You know, where was my father stuck? Where was my mother stuck? Not to judge them, maybe even to have more sympathy for them now that we're, you know, maybe in those same years ourselves. But <clears throat> to look back on that and say, all right, well, if if I experience that as a primal message that I was absorbing on a daily basis. I basically have three choices. Am I going to repeat that? Am I going to run from that and be anything but that? Or, or am I out there trying to fix it in some unconscious way, such as a life of, of you know, overcompensation or, or a life of self um, anesthetization or whatever? You know, wh where am I living the unfinished business of my mother's life, you know? And to realize, all right, I, I, if I have people around me, especially children, I'm, I'm also a profound influence upon their sense of what is possible and what is not possible, the range of permission, because a central issue here is, do we have permission to be who we are? And most people do not. Um, permission meaning accept who you are and and accept the fact that you have the right 
and the necessity and the summons to live a different journey. And you're here to live that journey. And if permission was given as a child, you know, <laughs> you're, you're, you're pretty blessed because that's rather rare. But if it wasn't given, which is pretty common, then you're going to have to find it for yourself. You're going to have to seize hold of it because it's not something you get from somebody else. It's something you realize, you know, I'm here to live this journey. It's one of the virtues, by the way, of mortality, uh, not a sentence you hear very often, is that it is our mortality that makes our life meaningful. If, if I were here in perpetuity, I could choose this path for a century and choose that path for another century and choose another. Nothing would matter because it was never over against the backdrop of non-being or ultimate consequences. And it is because I'm mortal that I have to recognize this is a, a precious moment between mysteries. And, and my role, my job here, my vocation, is to live that and make it as productive and as meaningful as I can in terms that are confirmed by my own psychological reality. Because again, if we do what is right for us, it'll be supported from within. And if we do what is wrong for us, it's always going to be contentious. We're always going to be at odds with ourselves. We're always going to be having to experience uh, one, one crisis after another. Yeah, well, you said a lot there. I actually just made a video about that today, the importance of contemplating, getting in touch with, becoming more comfortable with the fact that you're going to die and, and just some techniques to do that. Because, yeah, I think you're right. It places more meaning here in the presence and it really disabuses that whole notion of, oh, I'll get to it later or I'll do that eventually. Mm -hmm. sure. Makes that a little bit more difficult. I, I think what you're talking about, though, this midlife transition, it sounds to me like you're talking about initiation. Well, Which is it, something that maybe we went through culturally, but more, you know, previously, especially if you look at indigenous cultures, but we've kind of done away with that. So maybe what you're saying is the initiation into adulthood we go through now occurs when we're 35. Well, there's, yes, there's a truth to that. Uh, first of all, remember in uh, traditional cultures, ancient cultures, your midlife crisis was puberty at 12 or 13. And right. it's when, when you were not asked you were you were going to pulled out of the hearth and its protections oh, and yeah. created into the rigors and tasks and privileges of adulthood and our ancestors developed rites of passage because they understood through their own experience uh, the powers of fear and of lethargy they addressed those by trying to equip the child with uh, a, a sense of understanding a sense of relationship to a larger picture a sense of that personal capacity to to live the rigors of this journey. And, yeah, and, and it was fear of death. I mean, they were going to put the child in a situation where they yeah. thought they were going to die. They, yes. they weren't, but that was the illusion. Yeah. Well, in fact, sometimes they did. So the point is simply yeah. life experience. And uh, you're not allowed to remain in the sleep of childhood forever. Now, what we have in the disappearance of the rites of passage, uh, in addition to this extraordinary extension of our time on this planet, um, is, is really a prolonged adolescence. When you stop and think about adolescence, you realize it's that terribly awkward position somewhere between childhood, where our, our dependency is overt, and adulthood, where we're supposed to be wholly accountable. And we're all sort of looking around for for someone to tell us what it's all about and trying to find someone to cling to because it's too scary and, and too intimidating and to face it alone, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Short attention span, easily distracted by the loudest noise or the biggest uh, whiz bang. And, and you realize, well, that's that's American culture. I mean, that's yeah. the culture we have. That's Twitter. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. That's, that's, that's the political debates we're going to see here the next year. Absolutely. It's just sound bites. It, it doesn't very, mean anything. Very disheartening because it is so adolescent, so adolescent. Rather than facing the tough questions any nation faces, the tough questions of balancing resources, making value choices, and speaking truth. And rather than that, as you as you said, we, we have the Twitter world and, and we have this world in, in which there is this, who can offer the greatest flight from reality? And that's that's very depressing. Um, so 
Therefore, most adults, until life has knocked them down and forced them to really reconsider some things, say, you know, who am I apart from my roles? Um, who am I apart from my history? What is it I'm supposed to do with my life? These very basic questions. Most people don't ask those questions until they have to or until life demands it in some different way. And that's when the second half of life begins. Once in a while, it um, happens exactly at midlife as it did for me, but it sometimes happens when people lose their partner or they're downsized at work or, or they face illness and mortality or aging. It's in those moments. I mean, you know, uh, Tolstoy's famous novella, The Death of Ivan Illich, uh, which I think came out in the 1860, I think it was about 1862 in that area. Um, <clears throat> basically was about a person who lived wholly according to the dictates of his time. He married the right person, lived in the right neighborhood, espoused the right attitudes, and everything was fine. And his resume was building and he was successful. And one day there's a pain in his side that doesn't go away. And he's suddenly faced with his mortality. And there was no one to talk to about it because um, everybody was running as best they could from that kind of reality as well. And so it's only in the last few days of his life does he have honest questions about what is life about and what if my choices haven't been the best choices and, and why am I why have I been here that that he faces these questions and, and Ivan Illich in Russian would be something like John Johnson. It was meant to be the story of an every person who um, is so carried by the social structures and and concepts and fashions of his time that he doesn't have to bother to have a thought of his own, doesn't have to ever step out of it until a terminal condition apprise him out of that sort of easy flow and, and causes him to ask questions of existential significance for the first time in his life. Yeah, so what's a great way to, separate, to uh, go through this initiation? Because we don't have it in society. I found that really what initiation is, or just another way of thinking about it, is separation from your parents. You kind of hinted at it earlier in this discussion. It's separation from the parents psychologically, well, sure. creating a separate identity from them. And that would involve having you know, very honest and open and frank discussions with them. Uh, yes, when possible, that's helpful. And it's not always possible, but you know, you're... Right. you're the easy um, separation is the physical one. You know, in our culture, you go, you join the army, you go to college, you get married, whatever you do is like that's supposed to take care of it. You have a big body now. Yeah, but it big, definitely does not. And it obviously doesn't because yeah. what's boiling inside are our friends, the parent complexes, which is the internalized experience of right. the family of origin. And one keeps reporting to that on a daily basis, whether one's conscious or not, that never fully goes away. Again, the pragmatic question, though, is what do they make you do or what are they keeping you from doing? That's the real question. Until those kinds of influences begin to be brought into consciousness and confronted and addressed, um, one's still living one's parents' house. I began a book called Hauntings uh, some years ago with the sentence, we all live in haunted houses, because we do. Our, our, our psychic life is like a big old mansion with all kinds of presences, invisible specters of influence uh, that are with us from the past. And we just need to be knowing more and more about what kinds of influences are making our choices for us, why we choose that person rather than someone else why we choose that career, why we choose this particular lifestyle choice. You know, we think we're free because we're adult and functioning. Um, most of what we do is coming from unconscious sources, for good or for ill. So what are some other good ways to separate from your parents? Well, recognize, you know, they were someone else's children. And mm -hmm. Many of them didn't have access to the information and permission that you have today. Um, my parents, for example, their parents came from the 19th century. And they were defined by social roles, very strong, fixed concepts of belief, 
um, such as gender roles, you know, what it meant to be a woman, what you could do and what you couldn't do, what it meant to be a man, what you could do and what you couldn't do, um, social roles, ethnic roles, religious roles, racial roles, uh, sexual identity roles, and uh, value roles. All of these things were thought by them, and I was raised with this, to believe either they came from God or we're in the nature of nature itself. And now we know those, those social constructs were in fact constructs, human made, and many of them have been deconstructed. That doesn't mean that the chaos doesn't flow in, in, <laughs> in their place at times, but all, with that also comes the possibility of, of greater freedom. In other words, there's never been a time in history uh, that was better for, for a woman to be on this planet, given the, the, the oppressive nature of so many, uh, you know, gendered roles. Why are they so unhappy? I, I mean, I know what you're talking about, and some of it is, though, based in, in nature, right? I mean, especially if we're talking about the biological differences between men and women, some of it is natural, but you are talking about just a opening up of what is possible. Yeah, I wasn't talking about biological uh, realities. I'm just talking about social constructs that are okay. on that. That's a quite a different story. And when, maybe the reason why a lot of women are unhappy now is because, well, they they do have more choice. Well, and yeah. Without following an inner voice as we've been talking about, then it just becomes overwhelming. Well, look, today's young woman and today's young man has greater freedom of possibility than any time in human history. Now, they may be intimidated by that, yeah. they run from that, they may not even know that, but this is a unique moment in history. That's mm -hmm. it. We have to have compassion for those who went before us because they were not only ignorant, ignorant so often, and I say it respectfully, but they, they also were victims of it. And if, if we're to free ourselves, yep. we have to recognize those limitations and, and to realize, all right, now, I have to define myself in terms that seem to rise out of my own nature, not necessarily the constructs imposed upon me, which are quite different things. Yeah, the structure in society has gone, it's been removed from the outside, which is good, right? I, I agree. I mean, we've, we've definitely come a long way, but we need to replace that structure with an inner structure. Well, sure. And okay. I think that goes back to what you were talking about of paying attention to your feelings, right? Uh, your energy, your boundary. And and your sense of calling, you know? Yeah. I mean, we all need to identify with something larger than we are. And by that, I mean, I mean, for many people in history, it was the, the tribal experience, the tribal mythos, if you will. Um, for many of us today, it's, all right, what am I called to do with my life's energies in the fields of relationships, the fields of work, the fields of creative and spiritual life. I mean, what, what am I called to do uh, as an individual? And not to look over my shoulder at what somebody else is doing, which we all did in childhood, naturally. Um, but to say, all right, you know, where am I supposed to show up in this life and, and be present in a way? And, and that kind of invitation and opportunity historically uh, has virtually never occurred in history before, except for individuals here and there. Yeah, totally new challenge. Mm -hmm. I, I think we often look at it and think, oh, it's a bad thing. Oh, no, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just, are we going to rise up and meet this challenge for what it is? Sure. And sure. I think that's something that you get with depth psychology, with Jungian analysis, and you know, mm -hmm. just going to a cognitive behavioral therapist and them saying, oh, well, you know, go to a public speaking workshop if you're afraid of it. I mean, that's Mm -hmm. That could be helpful, but I, I don't think that's the real work that people are looking for in therapy. No. Well, and I, I sometimes think of, of depth psychology as, as really an effort to bring one's stories to the surface and to challenge them. And by story, I mean the interpretations of the world that we had as children, because they're, they're, they've been playing a formative role in our choices. To, to, to bring those stories to the surface and to challenge them and to separate our journey from our stories. Some of our stories will be supportive and helpful to us. Some of them will, will be oppositional to our well-being. And you have to sort through those stories. That's why I say I'm not 
what happened to me. I am what is wanting expression in the world through me and as I serve the life force. Mm -hmm. That's a whole different orientation. And, and it ultimately involves questions of meaning and ultimately involves asking of that individual, um, not just insight, that's important, but courage and persistence, you know, because nothing ever changes uh, without courage to face whatever life asks us to face and, and doing it over time as best we can, as often as we can. And that's how our life actually evolves and changes and goes in a different direction. Yeah. And realizing you're not alone, that we're all doing this. We've been doing this work for thousands of years. I always re reference the story of Philoctetes, right? Mm -hmm. He was trying to figure out how to use his trauma. Exactly right. Like we all are, you know, you know, and, and, and we will be for another, th as long as we're humans, we're going to be working with this. In, a, in one sense, it may be simple, but also it can be very difficult, even though it's simple. Well, the, the more we study human history, the more we realize we're all its carriers. I'm not superior to anybody in the past. I just have access to information and technology they didn't have. We live in different mm -hmm. structures and social values, but the human psyche is essentially unchanged. Uh, we haven't evolved per se as humans with a, f a few exceptions. I mean, we've evolved in social habits and so where we don't think of children just as property and that sort of thing. And we abhor slavery or so we say. Uh, th those are social changes and attitudinal changes. But the human psyche is as capable of, of any insight or of any uh, appalling behavior as was true thousands of years ago. We have ample evidence of that. And, you know, you can see the atrocities of history playing out in today's newspaper. And you can see these great gifts of the human spirit that occur as well. And the, the whole point is human psyche hasn't changed. The structures around it has ch have changed and the values often around them have changed. However, in the end, I, I have to recognize that what is right in the world is in me and what is wrong in the world is in me. And I have to be accountable for both of them. Yeah, that's a great place to end up and a, a great place to end this discussion. Thank you, Dr. Hollis. Man, you're easy guest to have on. You can just talk. I really appreciate that. Lots of good things to say. Well, thank you. It's a privilege to be with you, and I uh, wish you and your uh, listeners quite well. And where can we reach you? Just jameshollis.net? Yes, that's fine. Yes, Maybe. I uh, quite a bit of speaking on the road and people are welcome to um, come to those programs by and large and uh, maybe I'll meet them in person someday. All right. Thank you, Dr. Hollis. Again, I appreciate you coming on the show um, and have a happy new year. Thank you very much. And I wish the same to you, sir. Be well.